Morning everyone. Many of you would have been to Hampton Court. It's a Tudor palace located 20 kilometres southwest of London. It was built by Cardinal Wolsey beginning in 1515 and seized by Henry VIII in 1529 when the Cardinal fell out of favour. It's a magnificent palace along with St James's Palace, it's one of only two surviving palaces out of the many owned by Henry VIII. Apart from the magnificent palace itself, there are many points of interest at Hampton Court, including the celebrated maze, the historic tennis court, and, I'm getting to the point, the huge grapevine. This grapevine is apparently the largest known vine in the world. It's nearly 250 years old. It measures four meters around the base and its longest branch is over 36 meters long. The fruit produces each year around 500 to 700 clusters of grapes which weigh over 270 kilos. It's known, not unsurprisingly, as the grapevine. But as we shall see, there is an even greater vine. Today we're completing our sermon series on the I Am sayings of Jesus from John's Gospel. So far we've looked at six of them, and today we look at the last of these sayings. Sayings by Jesus about himself. If you can, why not take the time to review some or even all of these I am statements over the next seven days, one per day, to build a clearer picture in your mind of who Jesus is, what he means to you, and to draw closer to him. The sermons are available on St Paul's website to help you. It will repay the effort, I'm sure. But let's now turn to the last of these sayings. We're going to look at the passage that we've just heard read by Nick from John chapter 15 verses 1 to 8. If you have a Bible um, handy, that would be very helpful. First of all, where does this passage fit in? Jesus and his disciples have finished the meeting in the upper room in Jerusalem where they have celebrated the Passover. The last verse of chapter 14 indicates that they just left that place and were making their way towards the Garden of Gethsemane. The disciples at this point were anxious about what lay ahead. Jesus wants to calm and reassure them and give them some final words of advice. Among the teaching and instruction, Jesus tells them about the fine branches. He begins by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener, or vine dresser in earlier versions. He doesn't say, I'm like a vine. He's not just comparing himself to a vine. Equally, he doesn't say, I'm a vine, as though there are many vines, and he is just one of them. No, Jesus says, I am the vine, the one and only. But that's not all. Jesus says, I am the true vine. How can a vine be true? If Jesus is the true vine, who or what is the untrue vine? Jesus was referring to the people of Israel. Throughout the Old Testament, the grapevine was a symbol of the people of Israel. In fact, in the temple, the very heart of worship, there was a massive vine which stood over the entrance to the sanctuary. A, te a technical break. Back to the massive vine in the temple. It was made of gold and standing nearly 30 metres high. 
The vine was so famous that even Tacitus wrote about it in his history. It was a symbol of the nation of Israel and its prosperity. As a first century Jew, you would be very familiar with the symbolic meaning of vine and vineyard. The Old Testament frequently refers to Israel as being a vine that God planted. As a Jew of this time, you would have recited Psalm 80 in your morning prayers. In verse eight, eight, verses 8 to 9, the psalmist says to God, You brought the vine out of Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. You cleared the ground for it. It took deep root and filled the land. You would know how God brought Israel out of Egypt and planted it in the promised land. You would have read the words of the Hebrew prophets, who also likened Israel to a vine or vineyard. You would recall the words of Hosea, who said that Israel was a luxuriant vine that yields its fruit. But Hosea went on to say that Israel's prosperity had unfortunately led to increased idolatry. The more his fruit increased, the more altars he built. You may have chanted these words of Isaiah. My beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He expected it to yield good grapes, but it yielded only bad fruit. No doubt you were haunted by God's words spoken to his people through Jeremiah. I planted you as a choice vine from the purest stock. How then did you turn against me into a corrupt wild vine? God did not find the fruit he was looking for from Israel, his beloved vine. The vine of Israel had proved to be false. In contrast, Jesus claims to be the true vine. In contrast to Israel, which became unfaithful and incurred God's judgment, Jesus remains faithful and thus fulfills Israel's calling to be the vine of God. Jesus announces that he is the new and faithful planting of the Lord. Not only that, in verse 5, Jesus tells his disciples, I am the vine and you are the branches. Jesus makes it clear that there are two different kinds of branch, fruitful and unfruitful. Which one are you? Which one am I? Are we fruitful branches? Do we produce what is pleasing to God? Or are we unfruitful branches? How can we be sure which we are? This passage tells us there is only one difference between the two. Fruitful branches remain or abide in the vine. Verses 5 and 6 explain this clearly. If you remain or abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain or abide in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. The secret of the fruitful branch is that we remain or abide in Jesus. The key word here is remain or abide. Older Bibles use the word abide, while newer versions, like the one we heard this morning, use remain. Personally, I prefer the word abide. It carries the sense of sustaining a union with, continuing or enduring. I read that the original word used by Jesus was the Greek meno, meno, meaning remain, stay, or abide. It describes a profound, intimate, and enduring relationship. In the short passage that we've read this morning, Jesus uses it eight times. So it is the key to understanding his message. The most important thing for a branch is to stay connected to the vine. Only a branch that receives the life-giving sap from the vine will live and bear fruit. And so it is with us. 
Many people live their lives as if they are independent vines. They think that they can please God in their own strength and effort. But we're not autonomous vines. We're only branches. And as we are branches, the most important thing that we can do is remain with Jesus. He says, if you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. And the opposite is true. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. But what does it really mean? Apart from me, you can do nothing. In reality, we can do a lot apart from the vine. We can raise a family. We can build a career. We can preach a sermon. We can earn hundreds of euros. We can climb Mount Everest. We can put a man on the moon. We can do all these things in our own capacity. And they can even go very well. So why does Jesus say, apart from me, you can do nothing? There's one thing we can't do on our own, apart from Jesus. We can't produce fruit if we are disconnected from the vine. Branches can't do that. We can't produce the obedience and righteousness that pleases God if we are not connected to Christ. If we continually operate independently of Jesus, we might look pretty good on the outside. We might feel successful and self-sufficient. And we might even do very well in human terms. But we will never produce the fruit that God is looking for. How many of us go through life trying to do things in our own strength, pausing only occasionally to connect with God and depend on His power? <coughs> the truth is, we're incapable of pleasing God until we are utterly dependent on Jesus. There is only one way to please God, abide in Jesus. Not only does the vine dresser cut off every branch that bears no fruit, but he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it will be even more fruitful. Verse 2. Why does the vine dresser prune the vine? He carries out drastic pruning to make the vine more fruitful. What's more, he does the pruning in winter when the vine is dormant at a time when there is no fruit to be seen. But as a result of the pruning, the vine is prepared to yield a bountiful harvest at the appointed time. Likewise, fruitful branches are pruned by the Father. Useless branches are thrown away. Only those which are worth the trouble are pruned. In other words, the Father only prunes those branches which he expects to bear fruit. Pruning is a painful process. The vine branch is significantly disfigured. God's pruning in our lives may take the form of suffering, difficulty of some sort, or adversity. How do we know when God is pruning us? When we, come, when we become more reliant on the vine for strength and support, when we turn to Jesus for refuge and comfort. At work, when that long sought-after promotion is denied you, you're deeply disappointed and you feel rejected. But it turns out, in fact, that you find yourself with more time for your family and more time for God. The pruning has borne fruit. <laughs> your husband or wife is offered a posting in Belgium. It's an offer too good to refuse. But it means giving up your job, cutting yourself off from family and friends, to come and live in Belgium, of all places. You're lonely 
and depressed. But one day, a friend invites you to fun toss or to church, something you haven't done for years. Your faith is reunited. You feel the love and warmth of being part of a Christian community. You feel close to Jesus. You come alive. The pruning has borne fruit. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 11 teaches the same message. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 7 that the Apostle Paul was given a thorn in his flesh. He pleaded with God three times to have it taken away. God refused, saying, My power is made perfect in weakness. Paul goes on to say that for Christ's sake I delight in weakness, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, then I am strong. God's pruning of Paul produced a great harvest of fruit to the benefit of Christ's followers in his day and down through the ages. We knew a couple from South Africa. They came to St Paul's and were members of our home group. They told of a time when they were without work in a foreign country. They had next to no possessions. And yet, this was the time in their lives when they felt most close to God, full of His Spirit, joyful even, despite their hardship. Life had brought them low in terms of material things, but they were on a high in terms of their relationship with God. The pruning in their lives had borne fruit. Jesus tells his disciples in verse 3 that they are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And we see in the NIV footnote that the Greek for prunes, the verb that is, also means cleans. So one of the ways that we are pruned or cleaned is by the word of God. God's word applied by God's spirit activated by humble faith and dependence, sends the life-giving power of Jesus coursing through us. For those who abide in Jesus, there is in verse 7 the promise, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. How can this be? Surely God's not giving us an open-ended promise to give us whatever we want. But look more closely, and you see there is a condition attached. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. In other words, those whose lives are in harmony with Jesus may ask whatever they wish, because their prayers are controlled by his word. In James 4, verse 3, he cautions against prayers which are self-centered and not Christ-centered. When you ask, you do not receive, because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasure. If we abide in the Lord, He will heed our prayers, because they are in harmony with His purposes. If you abide in Jesus, you will bear much fruit. That's it. That's the message. It's that simple. Or is it? How do we do this in practice? How do we remain in Him? How do we abide in Him? We should be active members of a community or fellowship which knows and loves Jesus and celebrates Him as Lord. How difficult it is to be a solitary Christian how difficult it is to go it alone. We need the support and encouragement of fellow Christian brothers and sisters. Keep coming to church. Keep going to home group. 
keep meeting as prayer triplets, but whatever keeps you in contact with your fellow Christians, don't give up. We must also be people of worship and prayer in our private lives. Jesus is our role model. Time and again, he withdrew to a solitary place to pray to God, his Father. Likewise, we must keep contact with Jesus, taking deliberate steps to do it. For example, a few minutes in prayer each morning will set us up and keep us spiritually clean for the day ahead. It will mean arranging life, arranging prayer, arranging silence in such a way that never a day passes when we neglect Jesus. And this will be a constant challenge in our busy lives. But a routine of prayer will help, as well as taking opportunities as they arise. Where there's a will, there's a way. Think of the great vine at Hampton Court. Over the centuries, it has yielded thousands upon thousands of kilos of grapes. It has indeed borne much fruit. As followers of Jesus, he wants us to bear much fruit. The only way we can do so is to abide in Jesus. How will you do this? How will I do this? And so we pray. Heavenly Father, we can do nothing apart from the vine, our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to abide in him each day and for always, that we may bear much fruit. <laughs>